Okay, so for today's lecture, we're going to be talking about uh, continue talking about static failure theories, <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about brittle failure and fracture toughness. <clears throat> so again, we have the same process where we have to uh, calculate our forces, moments, torques, draw the free body diagrams based upon the load distributions, figure out where what locations have the highest stresses. Uh, make sure we account for these stress distributions <clears throat> and then calculate those stresses. Um, and then if it's ductile, we use von Mises, which we talked about in the last uh, lecture. And for the design purposes, we'd have to pick material and safety factor uh, against uh, the strength that we calculate, the tensile strength, yield strength of that material. In the case of brittle material, in the case of brittle material, we have to use a cool on more effective stress at each selected stress element based upon the principal stresses. Okay, so for brittle materials, we use the cool on more effective stress versus the von Mises effective stress. And then we'll have to compute our materials. But we're not done <clears throat> uh, y yet until we also consider the uh, fracture toughness if we suspect that a crack is present. And notice that's both for ductile and brittle materials. All right. Uh, as we discussed last time, we have both even and uneven materials. Um, so this uh, even material uh, led us to the von Mises stress and the shape of that diagram, the ellipsoid, based upon uh, <clears throat> the hydrostatic stress theory and the von Mises uh, effective stress. Okay. Um, and note that in failure, the principal stresses <clears throat> are twice of the uh, shear stress. Um, for an uneven material where you have uh, significantly greater ability to withstand compressive stresses and uh, less ability to uh, withstand tensile stresses, we have uh, uh, more unique failure characteristics and we have to account for this part of uh, that material. When we have some compressive stresses, uh, the failure modes are a little bit different. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, and keep in mind, if you're in that envelope, you're safe. If you're outside that envelope, your uh, your material will fail. <clears throat> okay, so material fails either in brittle or ductile man manners, and that's a material property. Uh, even materials behave similar similarly in both compression and tension, and tend to be ductile. Uneven materials behave differently in compression and te tension. So uh, we have to use the right failure theory. <clears throat> when we have some compressive stresses in a brittle material. Okay, um, brittle materials fracture instead of yield, although there's yield strengths that are published, they're really close to the ultimate tensile strength of a material. Um, so these are really close. So if you're getting close to the yield strength, you're also very close to the uh, failure point of the material. Um, the reason for this is that um, a lot many Brittle materials uh, are cast, and they can have microscopic flaws due to that manufacturing process. Uh, and they lead to uh, fracture under tension uh, much easier than uh, ductile material. But in, when they're in compression, the effect of those flaws are mitigated. So that's the primary mechanism why we get those uneven material behaviors. Okay. Um, again, uh, if we look at the pure stress strain test where we have an axial load, um, the principal stresses are larger than the shear stresses, um, and that's why we use the max shear stress uh, for some of these failure modes because we see that it's half <coughs> that of the principal stress that's applied. Uh, when we have pure torsion, um, the more circle looks like this, and the principal stresses are equal to the shear stress. Okay, so we can test these materials like we showed in the last lecture, so we won't go through that as much. But you can see these uh, failure mechanisms are different between uh, ductile and brittle materials. <clears throat> okay, and those are just highlighting where our uh, shear and principal stresses are for those loading conditions. <clears throat> so keep in mind, a material is going to fail according to its weakest strength, whether it's the shear strength okay, or the tensile strength. So for ductile materials, it's typically their shear strength. For tensile materials, it's typically their tensile strength. Okay. 
So uh, there's a number of theories that have been developed over the years that we haven't uh, uh, discussed all of them. Um, we derived and showed the distortion energy theory. That's the von Mises theory. That's the one that we use. There's also uh, these other theories. And for brittle materials, we have different theories and have a theory that actually matches experimental data, which is the modified uh, Moore theory. <clears throat> So if we look at the uh, ductile failure theory, this was the ellipse that we got um, from the von Mises uh, effective stress theory. Okay, and if we look at this, uh, uh, it's a symmetric plot. This is for a ductile material. We have to extend the compressive regions of these plots for brittle materials. And that's what you see over here. And if we were to take this plot uh, here, which shows some of the different ductile failure theories, the max normal uh, stress theory, the max shear stress theory, and the von Mises uh, stress theories. Those are all plotted here. And we uh, showed last time that the von Mises effective stress is the stress that uh, represents the experimental data the best. Um, but that's only this first uh, quadrant uh, here and we have to, uh, for compressive and uneven materials, we have to extend our uh, graph to account for the strength of brittle materials in compression, which is much greater than <clears throat> when they're in tension. Okay, so this is plane stress here where we have sigma one and sigma three. And so sigma one is always uh, greater than sigma three. And so, and which is always, sigma one is always greater than sigma two, which is always greater than sigma three. That's our sign convention. And so up here, it's when we have sigma one and sigma three that are positive, okay? So they're both under tension. Uh, when we get into these regions over here, then uh, one of these stresses is compressive, okay? In this case, sigma three and sigma one is tensile. And then over here, if one of these stresses is compressive, uh, in this case, sigma one, which would actually be sigma three because it would be negative, uh, and then sigma three, then <clears throat> we're in this quadrant here. So uh, just note that when you have stresses that have opposite signs, you're either in this quadrant, okay, or in this quadrant. But for our purposes, we really only have to consider this quadrant because we arrange uh, sigma one such that it's greater than sigma two, such that it's greater than sigma three, okay? And based upon these values, there's different theories that have developed over time. Uh, the earlier one would be the Coulomb-Moore theory, and it just says that, well, everything is the same when you're up here, uh, but when you have some compressive stress, we just go from that line that where we have the ultimate tensile strength and we draw a straight line all the way down to the ultimate uh, compressive, the strength, okay? Um, it turns out that due to the complex nature of the uneven material failure modes, that by modifying the Moore theory slightly, <clears throat> and instead of going from when you have zero, uh, going from the ultimate tensile strength, as a line all the way down to your compressive strength to define your failure uh, envelope or your safe region if you're outside you're in failure. Um, the modified Moore theory brings that that point instead of from uh, this zero point down to the compressive stress it takes it to the negative uh, tensile strength all the way down to your compressive strength. Okay. And it turns out that if you look here, this is failure data for gray cast iron compared to the different failure materials. And each one of these dots is where that material failed. Okay, so in tension, they all fail like very closely uh, along the uh, tensile strength of the material. So if you exceed the tensile strength, then you're going to fail. If you're inside of this region, then you can calculate your safety factor as a, as a distance to the closest line here. Now, when you're in compression uh, over here, and notice that all the lines are over here because to plot them over here, it would be redundant. Uh, we just reorder the 
the stresses. So we really only need this quadrant. <clears throat> um, but in this case, we find that the theory, uh, that the failure lines actually more closely follow this modified uh, more theory. So that the, in effect, the compressive forces actually allow us to go all the way down to minus the uh, tensile uh, strength in that material, and we don't get failure until we're somehow uh, over here. And what's important to note is that when you have an uneven material, a brittle material, um, you can have strengths that are greater than your tensile strengths, okay, in, in, in compression, right? But if you're in tension, right, so you, you exceed your tensile strengths, you're going to fail, but in compression, you can exceed your tensile strengths, and you're in this region here. So that what that means is now we have to consider these two regions, this region here where we're above the tensile strength of the material, the negative tensile strength of the material, and when we're below the negative uh, tensile strength of the material. So for our purposes, just to bring it back, for ductile materials we use the effect of von Mises stress, and for brittle materials we'll use the modified Mohr theory, which more closely and conservatively uh, estimates the failure, uh, the failure boundaries uh, for these materials. Okay, so the way we'd use that is we could look up our tensile strength and compressive strength of a material from that material data, look at the load conditions and find out where we are in this uh, envelope, and then calculate how far we are from the closest failure line, and that will be our safety factor. Okay. And when we're outside of these uh, uh, envelopes, then we have failure. Okay, so as I just said, this is the overall graph. This was from our um, even material, ductile material failure envelope. We extend it with the three, there's uh, different theories there, but we use the modified Moore theory here, this darker reddish uh, region. And we can take this, uh, quad, the two, first two quadrants, the first and fourth quadrants here, and we can look at uh, <clears throat> look at them in close up and zoom in on them here. So in this case, we have both the stresses are tensile. Okay, so our safety factor is just the tensile strength over the largest uh, stress. Okay. Now, uh, when we're in this region here, uh, we use the same um, safety factor. Okay, as we do up here. But when we're below uh, this point here, we have to account uh, for um, the <clears throat> this this change in slope here, and then calculate the safety factor as a distance there. All right. So if we are if we have a state of stress, sigma one and sigma two are positive. That'll put us inside of here. And let's say we're at point A, then the safety factor is going to be the relative distance uh, from A to A prime. Okay. If we're over here and we're above this um, a negative tensile strength, okay, we're going to use this same safety factor, which is just the ultimate tensile strength over the most uh, the largest um, principal stress, the largest uh, principal stress. But if we're below this point here on the graph, uh, then we have to calculate our safety factor against the load line. And if you solve for the load line, this is what you get in terms of your stress. That includes uh, your largest principal stress uh, and your other principal stress uh, in this case. Okay, and this is the modified Moore theory. These two equations are the modified Moore theory. So you need to know whether or not you're above or below. When you have compressive stresses, you need to check and see if they're above the minus uh, um, tensile strength of the material. Okay, so that's, those are the theories, and they're modified based upon the experimental data. If you're inside that envelope, you're safe. If you're outside that envelope, your material will fail, according to the theory. Now, <clears throat> uh, ideally, we'd like to compare the principal stresses to the effective stresses, just like we did, and, and get a single value of effect, effective stress, like von Mises. Uh, and it turns out that uh, Dowling also wanted to do that. It created the Dowling indexes to calculate the max stress calculated 
uh, per those equations, these three equations, and then we just compare it to the ultimate uh, uh, tensile strength, comparing it, not comparting it. <clears throat> All right. So in this case, what we do is, you can, and you can write this in software. If you calculate your stresses, you can all automatically calculate your dowling indexes, and then to find your effective stress, you just get the maximum of the dowling indexes and your principal stresses, um, um, and then um, if you come down here, then your safety factor is just going to be your ultimate tensile strength uh, over your effective stress from the dowling indexes. Okay, so we can show that through the example. This is the example that we worked last time uh, where we have an arm with a load. Uh, we're given the parameters of A and L. We can calculate the shear, uh, torque, uh, bending stress, and um, um, uh, shear due to the load on the elements at A and B. If we look at point A and calculate uh, the stress at point A, we can calculate it with our flexural formula due to the bending stresses, our applied torque due to the torque at that point. And then we can use those equations for uh, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy, or tau is the xz, and calculate our max shear and then our principal stresses from the equations for more circle, where this is the center of the circle, and this is the radius. Okay. So if we do that, we get sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. And uh, in this case, we've changed the material. Now the material is a gray cast iron with the ultimate tensile strength of 52,000 PSI. Um, and we use the modified Moore theory, which is that quadrant, that uh, the first and fourth quadrants for those... Um, that failure theory envelopes. And all we do is then use the first one where we calculate the safety factor based upon the ultimate tensile strength and the largest principal stress, which we always label as sigma one is greater than sigma two, greater than or equal to sigma three. Okay. And in this case, our safety factor is uh, 2.2. We could also do that by computing the Miller uh, indexes or the Dowling factor, sorry the Dowling factor. So if we plug the values in and calculate C1, C2, C3, we know sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. We take the maximum of those. Uh, then we get this sigma uh, uh, effective stress for the modified more effective stress. And it is uh, the same as we got over here in this case because sigma 1 is the largest. And the safety factor, again, is the same. So you can use this approach over here or you can use this approach over here. But if you use this approach, you got to make sure you're above or below um, the line. Now, in this case, we're also going to calculate the stresses at B. And the stresses here, we can see that the principal stress, one is positive and one is negative at point A. So that'll put us here, uh, sigma 3 being positive, sigma 1 being, uh, sigma 3 being negative, sigma 1 being positive and larger. Okay, and so that's why we use this for the safety factor. And we also will calculate the stresses at point B. If we calculate the stresses at point B, we take into consideration the shear stress uh, due to the shear load that's caused by bending. This, this uh, load here, this applied force, uh, causes the shear in the element, which we can find at point B. Okay, and we look at the 4V over A for a solid um, cylinder, find that the shear stress is 755 PSI, we can add that to the stress due to torsion, which is going to act at both A and B. <clears throat> and we get that uh, the principal stresses are here. Okay, and it's in pure torsion, and so they're actually um, all three the same, which is interesting, right? Which is what we would expect. Okay, so the principal stresses are equal and opposite to the shear stresses just like we see on an element on Moore's circle in pure shear. Okay? Um, because we're over here and we're above this line here, we don't have to use um, the load line. We could just compare the safety factor to the ultimate tensile strength as we do here, and we find the safety factor is 4.1. Uh, again, we can calculate the Miller, I mean, sorry, the Dowling factors. We do that, we can calculate them. And we can find the max of them. And the max, in this case, is going to be the same as the shear. 
and safety factor is the same using both approaches. Okay, so this is the this is the method that you would follow if you are um, if you have a brittle material. Okay, so if you have a brittle material, you have to use the modified more diagram. Make sure you're at the right location, and then you can calculate your safety factor based on your distance uh, to this line here or your distance to this line here, depending on whether or not you're above or below uh, the tensile uh, stress uh, for one of those uh, loads here. Okay, so now we're going to change gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about fracture mechanics. Okay. And um, fracture mechanics have caused people a great deal of headaches in the past. Uh, in World War II, the U.S. decided to weld ships together using ductile steel versus rivets. Uh, and they didn't, they were not aware of the uh, fracture mechanics theory. And they had these huge ships that would just split in two uh, like a brittle material. And it was extremely confusing. Um, to to them at the time and say well, you know what is going on and you can imagine uh, if you're the designer of this ship and it just splits in two and you don't have the theory to support your design uh, that you uh, <laughs> uh, you'd be in a bad way so we now know that this was due to crack propagation so what is crack propagation well crack propagation is part of a larger field of fracture mechanics and it affects both brittle and ductile materials and effectively um, the uh, f crack uh, propagation uh, which we'll see is also a big deal when we have uh, dynamic loads but when we have uh, cracks in materials um, we actually get really really high stresses as we've seen here this is our static this is our stress intensity factor uh, and so we see here that if we have uh, these ratios C over A, okay, so if um, the C over A uh, ratio is, is small, we can have really, really, really high stresses, okay? So these high stresses show up at the edges of the cracks. And in fact, if you have a, a sharp crack, the, the stresses theoretically go to infinity, okay? So that can cause a tear to rip through uh, a material if your stresses are too high. Now in ductile materials they can open up a little bit and uh, mitigate this process but in brittle materials it's uh, it's um, it's not slowed because they're they're more it's not as slowed because they're more brittle. Okay and so uh, we now know um, how to deal with these situations and we've been able to characterize how, how well a material uh, will stand up uh, under an applied load in the presence of some crack in the material. Okay, so when we have these materials and we apply loads, we know that actually all materials have cracks. Okay, and but we've they've done controlled experiments to find out the um, fracture toughness, which is a material property, and when then what we could do is calculate this stress intensity factor and compare it to the fracture toughness of that uh, material if we know we're going to have some cracks with some shape. Okay. Now, most of the research has been involved in this mode one uh, crack propagation where you have a load here that wants to separate uh, a material where you have a crack. Um, then we have mode two. Mode two is this mode where these loads are acting on these two faces and you have a crack here. And then you have mode three where you have these loads op operating to uh, split these materials. Um, and then you have a crack here. So uh, the, the, the theory of elasticity is what people use to describe these stresses. Okay. And it looks something like this where we have these stresses in X, stresses in Y, and shear stresses here that are a function of um, the crack uh, radius um, or how far away you are from the crack and then the angle uh, of, of relative to the crack. Okay, so we can calculate these stresses near these cracks using the theory of elasticity. Uh, for plane stress, sigma z is zero. Um, <clears throat> and we can take a look at that. Okay, so note, note that we're talking about the stress intensity factor, 
which we have to compare against fracture toughness, which is a material property. So the stress intensity factor, whether it's different modes, K1, K2, K3, okay, and the K1, K2, and K3 respond to mode one, mode two, and mode threes. Okay, we can calculate our stress intensity factors and then we can compare them against our fracture toughness, which is a material property, okay? So if the value of the stress intensity is less than the fracture toughness than the crack is in a stable mode uh, for static loads in a non-corrosive environment, it's in a slow growth mode in time varying load in a non-corrosive environment, which means it's going to grow. In a corrosive environment, a crack will grow. Or it's in a fast growth mode if the vir environment is corrosive, okay? So if you have a crack present in a material, okay, either with time varying loads or in a corrosive environment, your crack will grow of that material. And at some point, if the stress intensity of that component exceeds the fracture toughness, then you're going to get catastrophic failure, okay? So uh, this shows what the stresses look like uh, when we have a crack in a material with an applied load. This is what it looks like. So we have this zone here um, where you, if you can look at the angle uh, at the crack tip, okay? Um, and that's the effect, that's the von Mises stress. This is for ductile material. Um, and you can also take a look at the von Mises stress as a function of the distance from the crack, okay? So you see here, if we're really, really, really close to the crack, we have super high stresses, okay? And those stresses are distributed around uh, the crack tip here like this, okay? So you get really high stresses right there at the crack and you can get uh, plastic yielding at, at the crack tip due to those stresses. Now, uh, for our purposes, all this, what, all this boils down to as the first approximation back of the envelope ca calculation is if we have some cracks present, okay? And note that in this case, we have the situation where A is much less than B, and B is your distance to the edge of the artifact, and A is half the crack length, okay? So this is, a, this is the common notation to use A as the radius of the crack, okay? Or half the crack length because it's not a perfect circle. So we just say A is half the crack length. So this is how we calculate our fracture uh, toughness, <clears throat> okay? So if we have this situation here, where we have a crack in a material that's far away from the edge, note that half the crack length is a lot smaller than B, which is the distance to the center of the crack, then we can use this equation here to calculate our stress intensity and then compare that to um, the fracture toughness of the material, okay? So we can take our nominal stress, which we just get from the, the load over the area, times uh, pi times A, where A is half the crack length, and A is much less than B, which is the distance to the edge. All this says is you gotta be far away from the edge, you can use this theory here, okay? Now, uh, if you're on the edge, you can use this equation with about 10% accuracy, okay? And that's in the case where the crack, half the crack length um, is over B is less than 0.13, okay? So that means you don't have a super deep uh, crack, <clears throat> okay? In this case, you can use with 10% accuracy this equation, okay, where it's 1.12 times the nominal stress. So it's higher because you're closer to the edge, okay? Now, <clears throat> if you have other geometries where you're not in the middle far away from the edge, or you're not at the edge with the constraint that A over B is less than 0.13, then you have to calculate beta. And then multiply your, get your stress intensity factor from your nominal stress, your half crack length, and then this factor beta, which you can find in different handbooks such as the 
Machinery's Handbook. Okay, now I'm going to say it again. The fracture toughness is a material property. The stress intensity factor uh, which is different than the stress concentration. So we have three words that we need to make sure we don't get confused. Stress intensity factor uh, that has to do with cracks. Fracture toughness is a material property that has to do with cracks. And then we have stress concentrations which have to do with the cross-sectional changes in geometries. Okay? So, remember the difference in the three terms. All right? When we have a stress intensity in the material from a crack that's greater than the fracture toughness, the crack will suddenly propagate to failure catastrophically. It will split the split it into. Okay? Now, K is calculated based upon the mode so we need to make sure that we're dealing with the right mode. The equations that I showed you were for the first mode. You can find two and three modes um, in your handbooks, such as the machinery's handbook. So you have to, there, K is based upon the mode, and then the load, uh, which is the nominal stresses, <clears throat> results in the nominal stresses, and then the crack geometry. Okay, the, all right. So now we have another safety factor to consider. And this safety factor is the safety factor for fracture mechanics failure. And this is just the calculated stress intensity. I mean, sorry, the, the fracture toughness over the calculated stress intensity. And obviously you want this to be uh, greater than one. <clears throat> okay. Now, dynamics, as we'll see when we look at uh, dynamic loading is going to change this and the environment if it's corrosive will also change this okay so as a designer um, you have to keep these things in mind and it's very important if you're designing something that's sensitive to uh, fracture or close or you have a small safety factor then you can't leave that machine outside uh, or leave it on, uh, you know, outside near the ocean, where you have a more corrosive environment because you can have a problem. Okay, so you have to deal with that. Okay. Um, now, the the property of fracture toughness of a material um, is given here for different materials. This is a fracture toughness for different materials, some steels and aluminums. Now, fracture toughness uh, increases at higher temperatures. Okay, so you, if you have higher temperatures, your fracture toughness increase. But it also parallels ductility, okay, um, inversely. So a higher strength, I mean, it, it parallels ductility in that if you have a higher strength steel, it actually has a lower fracture toughness because it's inversely related to ductility. Okay, so this has caused problems in, in the past because people, uh, due to uh, increased loads, will get a higher strength steel, uh, which has a lower fracture toughness, but they're not designing against cracks, they're designing against the max loads. And so people have had uh, created problems uh, where they create these, they put in these higher strength steels which have lower fracture toughness, but they don't even consider it. Okay. Um, for most engineering materials, the, f the range of fracture toughness is between 20 and 200 megapascal meter squared. Okay. Now, another thing uh, that is important is this term orientation. And this is actually the grain orientation of the material. So it's not so simple uh, necessarily for you to just go you know, pick 60, 61, aluminum, blah, 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 and throw it in your design. If you have a design where you're designing kind of to the limit of the material's ability, you have to consider also that the grain orientation matters and the manufacturing method matters because it affects um, different material properties such as the um, fracture toughness. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> 
So for example, like, let's just take this 20, 7075 aluminum plate. I mean, depending on the, manu the form and the orientation of the material, then you can have fracture toughnesses that go all the way from you know 18 all the way to 60. Okay. So if the your design is sensitive to cracks or you have cracks or openings in the material, um, you know, then this is something that you must take into consideration. So let's just talk about how this affects our safety factor. All right. So this is a steel strap here. It's just a strap of steel. It's holding up 60,000 uh, newtons of static load and axial tension. Uh, and somebody accidentally cut it when they were making it because maybe they left it under another material or whatever. Or they put something, they cut it. Oops. Okay. So now this material is actually cracked and it will affect our safety factor. Okay. Well, how does it affect the safety factor? Well, first we can just find the nominal stresses. We're told we got a 60,000 newton load. Uh, we're given the geometry of the cross-sectional area. We can divide the load by the area, find that the stress is 250 megapascals, all right? And then we can look at the um, uh, failure criteria. Uh, it's both the principal and the von Mises stresses as the uniaxial stress, okay? So the safety factor in this case is just 540 over 250, which is 2.16, okay? So you may think, okay, well, this load is nice. Um, the safety factor is good. We're good to go. But because somebody nicked it and and now we have a crack and this uh, crack uh, here is small. It's a 10 millimeter crack. Okay. But the material is pretty thin. We have a 3 millimeter thickness. Um, <clears throat> and it went all the way through. So then we can look here um, and we, we see that the width of the crack is 80. or the width of the beam is 80. So since the <clears throat> width of the beam is 80, we use the, the whole width, and that comes from this, this expression here, okay? So in this case, when we have an edge crack, we use a B that's over here, um, and we use this equation here. So if A over B is less than 0.13, we can use this expression. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. We're using the B as the overall width. And then we use the crack uh, length here. It's 10 millimeters. So it's one eighth of this overall width. So A over B is 10 over 80, which is 0.125 or an eighth. So we can use it. We can use this stress intensity uh, uh, equation that we have, which is K is equal to 1.12 times the nominal stress times pi or A. Okay, which gives us 49.63 uh, megapascal uh, square root uh, meters. So if we then look at the safety factor against crack propagation, um, we can look at our stress intensity factor for the material, which we're given or could look up at 66 uh, megapascal uh, meter to the half power, uh, divided by what we just calculated, 49.63. <clears throat> we find the safety factor is 1.33. Okay, so now failure is predicted when we have any sudden overload that's 33% over the expected load. Okay, at which point uh, the nominal stress is actually less, less than the yield strength, but it'll still cause that crack to go all the way through. Now we can also use this uh, um, <clears throat> analysis for uh, the stress intensity to find um, a crack that would be necessary to cause failure uh, in that equation, okay, by uh, back solving for A, okay? So in this case, a would have to be 18 millimeters for this these loading conditions, which is greater than the width. Okay. And, but also remember that when we use this equation, we only have about 10% accuracy. So this safety factor, you need to uh, maybe add plus or minus 10%. Uh,
Um, so there's other materials that you can use. If you have these sort of situations, you should definitely look up um, and find out your particular application and go through the manuals and recommended uh, material for that <coughs> particular application. All right, so this concludes the lectures on static loading theories and um, stresses. Okay, so what we've done is for both brittle and ductile materials, we've been able to relate a combined state of stress to an effective stress. We can compare that effective stress to various failure criteria, okay, <clears throat> using these effective stress, effective on Mises stress, or modified more for brittle material. And then we can use these to estimate the safety factor for that load based upon the appropriate uh, strength of that material. Okay, we have stress concentrations due to changes in geometry. Okay, those are different than stress intensities and the stress intensity factor um, of a material. We have to use stress concentration factors um, before calculating the effective stress. Okay, we have to increase it with the stress concentration that's due to the cross-sectional geometry changes. Um, we have to look at the fracture mechanics if we think cracks are present or expected to be present in an application, uh, which is what we just shown. Um, and we also have to keep in mind the conditions that a part is actually going to experience in service, okay, as temperature and moisture and the corrosion, corrosive environment will sig will, can significantly affect the safety uh, of that uh, material. Now, we haven't considered the dynamic uh, or fatigue failure mechanisms and how it affects these stress concentrations and stress intensities um, and loading conditions. And we know that it accounts for about 90% of failures uh, for uh, dynamic loading. And we also know that ductile materials behave like brittle materials in the presence of dynamic loading. And we will talk about those uh, soon. All right. <clears throat> also a caveat is we have not considered creep and creep is when you get materials that will move under elevated temperatures with uh, constant loads that are less than the load to cause plastic deformation. So that concludes this lecture and feel free to shoot me any questions you might have.